status update from Shad in the Hudson River. Um, give you a little bit of a history of um, Shad in the River. It's already covered a lot of that, uh, thank goodness for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of the management uh, actions have been done since closure in the Hudson and uh, kind of what research we've been doing since then. And then kind of what's next. Uh, we've closed the fishery, unfortunately. Um, what, what's what's going to happen now? Um, so before I get into a little, into that stuff, I wanted to talk a little bit about the stock specific life history stuff. So Aaron uh, set that up pretty well for me. Um, so in the Hudson, these uh, these anatomist fish mostly spawn in May. Um, they're spawning over shallow water shoals, mostly in the upper river. Um, and they're, they're, they're known to be batch spawners, so they're not just uh, spawning all at once. They're, uh, they keep developing eggs as the season progresses and they keep spawning. Um, they're Enteroparis in the Hudson. Both sexes are fully mature uh, by eight years old. And the maximum observed age that we've had in our samples is a 13-year-old female. Um, and uh, the maximum age for a male is, is, is 10 that we found in our samples. Uh, the nursery habitat are where these young ear uh, are hanging out are basically, basically the freshwater portion of the lower tidal Hudson from Newburgh to um, all, all the way up to all the way up to Troy Dam or around 56. And I'm going to really regret not having a map <laughs> on this to point all that stuff out, but uh, hopefully I, I'll point those things out later. On. And um, the YOI are generally leaving the river by November. There's some fully holdovers, but um, most of them are we, we found to leave by November. So as Karin uh, talked about, we have a really rich cultural history uh, with people in Shad and the river. Um, I'm not going to touch on it too much. I just kind of wanted to point out we had uh, a, we had a lot of different, uh, several different gear types of gill nets, stake nets, um, and, and haul seines. Those same gears were used almost all the way up through the end of the fishery. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out it was, it's not just a row fishery. People talk about shad row uh, being delicious. Well. Uh, also delicious are the uh, are the steaks, and you can see them. Um, they're, they're, these gentlemen are preparing them on cedar cedar uh, slats and cooking them over a fire with rapid bacon. So sounds pretty good, right? Um, but in addition to that, uh, we had a pretty popular recreational fishery here in the Hudson that took place below Troy Dam for the most part. Um, and this gentleman is holding the state record that was caught in 2007. I knew that was going to be a question of life. It was really big. Um, so this is my ode to Kathy Itala, this, this slide. Hopefully she will watch the YouTube video because uh, she's always telling me that I need to know the history. Uh, well, this is going to be a heck of a slide, so bear with me. Um, so. Uh, the, the, we think that the commercial fishery started uh, at about eight, in the mid-1800s, um, but we only have the grand landing records going back to 1880. And these are serving as basically our best proxy for abundance in the river, unfortunately, because um, uh, we're not really accounting for effort. Um, but the, the thing that kind of Kathy had always talked about and, and others is that, uh, oh, actually first, this is really important. These are Hudson River only fish. So these are landings of fish that are coming in, we think, are coming into the river to spawn. Um, and it's, uh, so just river and, river and landings. Um, so what Kathy had always talked about um, are these different peaks. So we have four different peaks, and each subsequent peak seems to be lower than the other, especially this last one, where it's probably orders of, you know, several orders, or at least an order of magnitude uh, lower than the other, than the other two or the other three. Um, but that's kind of important to think about. So our first landings are in 1980. We know the fishery was going on well before that. Um, and we also knew that there were a ton of different uh, habitat changes that were going on around the same time. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I think the one that's kind of really significant is we thought our people in New York thought the fishery was doing so poorly that in 1868 they passed the legislature to, uh, to have Hudson River shad, land, or shad regulations. And those were not only escapement, those were gear restrictions, those were area closures, and the bones of those regulations pretty much lasted all the way through, um, through, the, through the end of the fishery. Um, but needless to say, there were still some huge landings way back when, uh, obviously not compared to 
those in the Potomac in the 1800s. Thanks for putting that up card. Um, but we're talking, so we have thousands of kilograms on the y-axis, and we have five years where we're over 1,400 or 1.4 million kilograms uh, of fish landed. Um, so that was perceived, that was followed by some uh, some years where we're not actually sure what's happening. We think it's probably a combination of uh, a decline in abundance and just a lack of record keeping. But there's a pretty much a big stretch from 1900 to about 1930 where we don't have that many landings in the Hudson. Um, but what we do know was going on is we still had a ton of habitat changes going on. And again, I'm just going to single out one here. The population boom kind of drove all of this. So a lot of the uh, habitat changes, uh, the land use changes, that all sort of uh, came, to, came to a head um, with, with an increase, a huge increase in population in Lower Hudson. Um, and I guess one stat I want to put out there is by 1930, there were 7 million people, or thought to be 7 million people, on the sewage, uh, on municipal sewage lines in Middle and Lower Hudson. And uh, that was all 7 million people, of 7 million people's sewage going straight into the Hudson country. So that's, uh, that's a pretty staggering number, and that's just the mid lower Hudson. And that led to some summer, that led to summertime oxygen blocks uh, setting up around New York City, and then the same things were happening below, below uh, Albany and Troy. And those things really didn't get cleared up until uh, the Clean Water Act in 73. So that's a uh, pretty, pretty significant change there. But don't worry, with that population increase, we uh, needed some local good, cheap fish uh, and I think that may have initially started this um, this desire to catch shad again. Uh, so there's probably a combination of a recovery plus the need for uh, uh, local fish. And so that led to, uh, and I always have problems figuring out what that means. So I converted these to fish numbers based on 1936, uh, based on the 1936 mean weights that were for the Hudson River. And so this is 11, 11 straight years where they were harvesting over 700,000 fish coming into the Hudson. These are spawning stock fish. Um, and then during the war years, when we know that the regulations were relaxed a little bit, and there was probably also extra fishing pressure from the coast coming in fishing in the river, there was seven straight years of over 850,000 fish being removed from the spawning stock. So you can imagine what the population must have been uh, to be able to, to support such an intensive fishery. And uh, obviously it wasn't very sustainable uh, because we, we saw a sharp decline in landings. Um, in, in a really important paper uh, in 95, Carl Walters, um, he, he basically went back and recreated the Hudson landings and he came up with a CPU, ba CPUE based on a uh, number of nets that um, that were fished, or that were, uh, yeah, I guess that were fished, that were permitted. And he came up with a CPUE, and from those, he used, uh, he, he found a way to look at uh, recruitment levels, and he found that basically, since the 1950s, uh, the Hudson River has been subject to massive recruitment over fishing. Um, but the also, the other important thing he puts in here is, uh, it's probably exacerbated, exacerbated by entrainment effects. And so, uh, starting about here and ending in about 1976, we had nine different power plants that came online that were uh, once through coolers. Um, and so, uh, I think I found the staff that Car and have put together where that, when those nine power plants were operating at full capacity, it was roughly on the same order of magnitude as the discharge. Uh, that's measured below Troy Dam. So that's a lot of water being sucked in, and probably not great times um, during, so it very likely had some big effects on eggs and local fish, as well as juveniles that are emigrating out. Um, so uh, now to kind of round out the timeline, uh, it wasn't until 1980 that we really started uh, figuring out how to sample the Hudson with the Hudson River Fisheries Unit. The first, Atlantic States Marine Fishery uh, Commission Interstate Management Plan didn't, didn't go into place until 1985 on these species. Uh, we had our zebra mussel invasion in 92. Um, as a result of the 1998 stock assessment, uh, the, uh, the, the, the status of the, of the stock wasn't doing well along the coast, and so that led to some changes, and one of those was trying to close those mixed, uh, mixed stock ocean fisheries. 
and those were uh, those were finally phased out by 2005. And then, uh, based on a 2007 stock assessment, um, we basically didn't see any recovery in the Hudson stock, and so we came to a moratorium in 2010 for both commercial and recreational fishing. So hopefully, Kathy watches the YouTube. <laughs> And I covered most of it. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so now that the fishery's closed, uh, how are we going to keep monitoring recovery? Well, the first thing to look at is uh, what kind of management changes have happened since the closure. Um, so at, com also coming out of that 2007 stock assessment um, was this amendment to the, Amendment 3 to the Fisheries Management Plan, which required all states that wanted to have open fisheries in their state to have a sustainable fishing plan. So basically showing that any harvest that they're removing isn't gonna be impacting the stock. And so um, using whichever metrics that they, they deem, deem favorable uh, to keep their fishery open. Uh, and uh, amazingly, uh, both river systems, uh, our river system above us at the Connecticut River and the river system below us, uh, the Delaware, uh, they, they actually both have sustainable fishery plans and it seems like their metrics uh, are showing either st stable or increasing uh, populations. Uh, not so much in the Hudson. Um, in addition, uh, since closure, we've had some improvements in using genetics to examine the stock structure. As uh, Dr. Waldman discussed earlier, uh, or mentioned earlier, he and, he and Dr. Morgan put together a really nice paper on the, uh, the, the genetic uh, stock ID of fish that were being removed in Lower Delaware Bay. And um, so it actually led, when we were doing an update for the Delaware Bay stock assessment, uh, one, uh, one thing that we were proud to make sure we included was this uh, benchmark line. So uh, now everything it, below this line is considered mixed stock. And so we're, uh, when, we're, when we're looking at harvest every year, and this is for or every five years for the sustainable fishing plan, we can make sure that we're uh, fishing it below a target level set uh, for mixed stock. And uh, finally, we have, uh, there have been some improvements in uh, coastal waters and federal fisheries that we think might be having some impacts on shad and river herring as bycatch. Uh, there have been some uh, bycatch caps put in in the federal fisheries. So in the river, what's, going, what's kind of changed? Well, the water intakes have improved. Um, that's whether it's either due to uh, plants uh, actually shutting down or switching over to closed cycle cooling. The last, uh, the, the last power plant that we use that uses once through is Indian Point. That's going to be closing in 2020. Um, we've also had a lot of habitat improvement. Um, we've removed some dams. We've uh, right-sized some culverts, uh, and we're doing a lot of uh, kind of important uh, important things. And the one I kind of really want to point out is this Gaze Point project. So Karin talked a little bit about some of the dredge and fill that had happened. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Hudson as to try to channelize it, get more traffic up to Albany and over the Erie Canal. Um, so there's one project that, uh, that the estuary program has been working on where they've actually restored one of these backwater channels. Um, so it's obviously gonna be a big improvement for, uh, at least in this stretch, uh, for, for young and year uh, production. So in addition to that, uh, kind of the meat of the presentation is going into our long-term, uh, I say long-term, 1983 uh, fishery sampling efforts. So the first one, hey, here's my picture of the river. Um, so we have New York City down here, we have Detroit Dam up here. Um, so this is our Young Year survey, we use a 100-foot beach sand. Uh, we sample 28 sites every other week for nine weeks in the summertime, and we sample in four different sections, so those sites are mixed up in couple different sections. We've got Newburgh, Poughkeepsie, Kiksaki, and just below Albany. And the target are the low scenes. Um, it's done during the day. Um, and the result is that dismal graph that I showed earlier, where, uh, so I, just FYI, I came in here, so it's not, it wasn't me. Um, actually, this was me, though. Um, but what, what I'd like to point out sort of three different stances here. So we have some uh, high relative recruitment in the, through, the, through the early 90s. Uh, we have this um, seesaw line where we're seeing some uh, low years followed by high years followed by low years. And then finally we saw the drop, bottom drop off in 2002. Um, 
and Karin was nice enough to put that benchmark up there. So basically, again, three years below that bench, or three, three years before the, below that uh, action level, uh, we're considered in, on, in recruitment failure. So we've been at recruitment failure since 2002, really close to 2014. Um, so our other long-term survey is our spawning stock survey. Um, in general, uh, so this uh, initially this this survey was designed to catch both striped bass and American shad. Um, and in this stretch, you can see we use uh, we use haul savings. We also use electric fishing to, to supplement some of our sampling. But the majority of our sampling is using a haul sink. This here is a 500 foot haul sink, um, and we do those in two different regions. Uh, so Kingston, the Casco, Pixaki region, and uh, just south of Albany. Oh. And uh, th as this uh, <coughs> as as this project has progressed over time, it sort of developed more into a it's developed into a striped bass survey. So we're going out and trying to tag as many striped bass as possible. Um, so it's not really set up to do uh, to do relative abundance for shad. But since the stock stuff was coming up, we thought, well, why don't we try to come up with an, a, a, an, an index of abundance for adults? And uh, it didn't really work out very well. I tried to do some modeling, uh, but even my lizard stat brain knows that these error bars are not great when you're running a model. Uh, and you can't really put a line through that at all. So but before we decided to completely throw it away, we thought, well, why don't we compare with the young ear and see if anything happens? Um, and normally how you do that is uh, you lag forward the young ear to see if it matches up with what's coming back as adults. And uh, the magic number for us was four years. We lagged in four years. Back here, we're not seeing much correlation. But man, since 2003, we're seeing a really tight fit. Uh, so it gives us some confidence that our young year survey is actually uh, potentially tracking abundance. And also, we can predict what's going to be coming back from our young year survey. Um, it, I got a couple minutes. Two. Two minutes. OK. I'm going to do this one, and I'm not going to do the next one. So, uh, so it, we're not just counting fish, we're taking scale samples from them and doing some aging. And uh, so, so this, this is just, what you're seeing here is just with using our 500 foot seine. And um, so you can see that uh, on the, on the y-axis we have mean age and this is shad females. And we have uh, mean repeat spawn marks. And so we've actually seen an improvement uh, in recent years to, to older females, and then uh, a similar number of repeat spawns. But when I was making this graph, I was like, oh, oh wait, hold. I kind of put all hull sains in there. So we actually used a thousand foot hull sain for a while, and then switched over to the 500. And so I was like, well, so maybe this is just gear bias, right? Um, well, it could be. One year, in 1988, we did, but we sampled with both. So I did a really quick and dirty box plot of the, uh, of the differences between the two same types. And actually, there's no real discernible difference in uh, ages between the two gears um, or spawn marks between the two gears, which I'm a little concerned about. Uh, but one, one thing to think about is maybe these were fished differently, fished at different times uh, of the day or different areas. So that's something we're going to look into. But it gives credence into potentially using these values as recovery metrics, even though we've overfished them at this point. But maybe, maybe we go to this level instead of back here. Um, this is our mortality estimates. And you can see that our mortality estimates right now are about similar to what they were in the 80s. Uh, so now that everyone's bored, um, what, what are we going to do now? So we're going to go continue our, our, our long-term stuff monitoring. We obviously have to age a lot of fish. I don't know if you noticed that we had a lot of gaps in those in those uh, in those plots, but we need to age fish. And yes, Ben, we're probably going to do some odlets, which will be important to you. Um, and and uh, we have that 2020 block benchmark stocking system coming up. Um, from that, we hope to use those metrics to finalize our recovery, uh, publish a recovery plan for Hudson. And we've got other stuff going on where we're going to uh, manage going to be putting out a tracking manuscript to look at immigration and use in the river of the Chad. And then we're hoping to 
work with Dr. Uh, Nina Overgaard there Hilton and doing it uh, using her techniques of uh, whole genome sequencing uh, to come up with a little bit better stock ID. Sorry, I went long. Also, mm -hmm. thanks to all everyone that uh, works on our projects, our techs especially, without their hard work and dedication, we will do anything.